So I want to finish up time value today. Very, very important topic in finance. If you're an accounting or a finance major, you should just be able to do time value money without even thinking about it. Just, just be the second nature to you. Um, there's basically, well, six formulas, but four that you really need to know. So when you look at these formulas, you need to know immediately what to do with them. On the exam, really the challenge on the second exam is knowing which of the formulas you need. So you have this formula for PV, IFA. I don't ask you to memorize that formula. I'll give you that, or on the exam, you'll have it already built into the Excel. Same thing on the future value. They're not difficult formulas, but you know, you're, they're, it's, it's not a formula you really need to spend time memorizing. Although, again, I'll show you kind of the theory behind the PVIFA. It's an easier formula to understand once you see it, but how you actually apply it. So there's present value problems and there's future value problems. The present value of one cash flow is not that common. Where you'll normally see that is you hear them say, um, well, I, I can't even think in, in terms, yeah, there's, it's, it's rare you're going to have one cash flow in the future. You want to know what it's worth today. That's just a little bit unusual. Um, so uh, maybe one example is a zero coupon bond. We may talk about this. So you're going to get $1,000 in 30 years. That's you know, have, have y'all heard of a zero coupon bond? So treasuries, they're using treasuries, zero coupon treasury, 30-year treasury bond. So treasuries, that's the federal government borrowing money. The treasury federal government doesn't borrow money with zero coupons, but what finance finance people do. So they get a bunch of treasuries and put them together and they create all kinds of new securities. And one security they create is a 30-year bond that only has one cash flow. And it pays you $1,000 at 30 years from now. So the question is, what is the price today? Well, if the current yield is 4%, how much would you pay for that bond today? See how that's a present value number? Because what number do you know? You know the future value. So how much you pay for that today? So the, it's going to be the present value. It's going to equal the future value divided by 1 plus 0 0.04 raised to the what? In this case, 30 years to the 30. So how much would you pay for that bond today? So a thousand dollars divided by one plus 0 0.04 raised to the thirtieth, you'd pay three hundred eight dollars and thirty two cents. Did I say that? Get that right. So you pay three hundred eight thirty two today, and then thirty years from now you get a thousand dollars. Now, these are real popular at first because some investors figured out, hey, if I do that, I don't have to pay taxes for 30 years and I'll make 4% a year. And the IRS said, yeah, dream on. And so the IRS is actually going to tax you every year, even though you don't get a cash flow. So it's kind of a really negative bond. So the IRS does tax you every year, even though you don't get a cash until 30 years from now, because otherwise people would love these things because you have essentially deferred tax for 30 years. Um, but that's a zero coupon treasury bond. You can buy these things. They're what we call discount notes, which means you pay a lesser amount than today and you get a higher amount in the future. And your only return is that future cash flow you get. There's no, you don't get interest payments in the middle because there's zero coupon. That means there is no cash flow until the end. So that's a present value problem. We might, we might look at some zero coupon bonds, but that's that's one of the few. There's not that many uh, present value problems like that. What you see much more commonly is the present value equals the payment times the factor. And that's if you're, you, you know the price today and you wanna know what your payment's gonna be. 
All right, so you know the cost today. What is my payment? So you put the cost of the day is the present value. You get your factor, and then you that give you the payment. You take the cost of the day divided by the factor, and that give you your payment. Or you could say, how much car can I buy if I can afford eight hundred dollars a month for five years when current auto loan rates, and I don't know what are, what are auto loan rates today? Oh my word, I haven't looked in a while. Current auto, look at it. Google already knew what I was looking for. So over 6% it looks like. I never borrowed money for a car, so I don't know. You should always buy a car with cash. Uh, but let's say 625. So if we go back to our spreadsheet, what is our rate? 0 0.0625 divided by 12. Everybody remember why I'm doing that? 625 is your annual rate. 12 is monthly. How many payments am I going to make? Five times what? Times 12. So always remember, Whatever number you divide your rate by is the same number you're going to multiply the years by. So if it's weekly, you divide by 52 on the rate and multiply by 52 on, on that. So there's my factors. So how much did I say I could afford to pay? 800 a month. So how much of a car can I get? 800 times 51. So you could buy a $41,000 car. So you can go either direction or you want to know if I can buy a $41,000 car, how much will my payments be? So 41,000 divided by that. So it depends on what do you know? Do you know how much you can afford? That's why I don't like auto, auto dealers because they advertise cars that are what, 750 a month. It's like, no, that's not the cost of the car. That's, that's the loan payment, assuming, you know, monthly for six years. And what are they going to probably use six years? Cause they want the lowest number possible. Tell me how the car work costs, and then I'll figure out if I go to my credit union or go to, you know, so tell me. But I've seen auto, com auto commercials where they don't even tell you the cost of the car. They just tell you the monthly payment, which, you know, is kind of ridiculous. Um, so you can go either direction. Most, most of us know how much the car costs today. We just want to know what that payment is, but it's possible. You want to know how much of a car or a house you could buy. You could do the same thing with a house. So... One thing I think is really interesting here, let's say you have $1,000 a month for a mortgage. And let's say a few years ago, a mortgage rates were 3%. We're gonna do a 30 year mortgage. So how much of a house could you afford? afford a $237,000 house, how material is it that mortgage rates have increased so much? So 30 years, 742, does that make a big difference in the, will be 20,000, 30,000, 50,000? What do you think? Almost $100,000 makes a big difference. Now, when I graduated from college back in the dark ages, interest rates were that. I don't even know how people bought houses back in 1980. Mortgage rates were like almost 20%, which just made a huge difference. So low interest rates has a huge difference on the housing market. I mean, that's, that's pretty radically different. So you can do those type of analysis as well. Um, all right, future value, the future value equals what something is today, times some rate. This is usually when you're doing something with inflation. So I know something costs $10,000 a day, but I'm not gonna buy it for five years. 
I think inflation is going to be 3%. How much would it cost in five years? So one of your uh, Excel applications does that. So this guy says, hey, I want to buy a car. It costs 50000 a day, but I'm not going to buy it today. I'm going to buy it in five years. Uh, how much will it cost me in five years? Because I'm going to save up for it for five years. So I know it's going to be more expensive in five years. So that's a future value. You assume some inflation rate. It's almost always on an annual basis. We're not going to say, hey, we think inflation is going to be 4%, but on a monthly basis, we don't do that. In inflation, we just use annual numbers. So this is when you'll hear things like in today's dollars kind of thing. Um, although in today's dollars can be, so you can say um, a PC in 1980 costs. All right, so I bought a PC in 1987. I bought a PC and a printer. You might want to guess what that cost me in 1987 dollars. Yeah, you might think that. <laughs> you might be really shocked. And, no, you're gonna you're really going the wrong direction. <laughs> it was two thousand three hundred dollars. That was in 1987 terms. So what would that be today if I were to buy it? So let's say inflation's been, I don't know, three and a half percent, 1987, oh my word, 97, 2007, 17. So we're talking 35 years. Yeah, it was, it was like me buying a computer for $8,000 back then. It was just a computer with no hard drive. I had to load MS-DOS, which I don't know what that means. My printer was a dot matrix, which means it takes you six weeks to print anything. And I pay eight. My, the people at work, they were amazed. It's like me going out and buying a car. Essentially. They were just amazed. So, yeah, you know, you talk about computers being cheaper today, but they're a whole lot cheaper when you adjust for inflation. I bought a really nice laptop from uh, Best Buy with touchscreen, everything. Really, really nice laptop for 200, 200, 250 bucks. I mean, it's that would have put this PC here to shame. It was just not even been no internet. You know, it is just crazy. So, so these are these are valuable things to do. Um, I could certainly look like at a car. If a car I bought in 1986 probably would have cost four or five, six thousand dollars today would be forty. You know, it, cars are are much more expensive today, but PCs. The PC's gotten better and the cost of the BEC is cheaper. It's just pretty amazing. So in today's dollars, that's when you use that present value kind of function. I mean, that future value function. You want to know, hey, I know what it cost back then. What would that be in today's dollars? And then future value here, uh, we don't use this one formally that much in this class, but that's mainly a retirement type of calculator. So you could do it two, two ways. You could say, um, I, I want to invest $500 a month. How much would that be worth when I retire? Or you can say, hey, when I retire, I need $2 million, just like we did with the Carroll files. She needed, what, $1.7 million. How much does she need to invest every month to get there? So pretty common on a retirement planning type of thing. Pretty, pretty common to see those in spreadsheets out there. Um, and in fact, um, financial engines is a good example of ones so financial engines um i think vanguard actually uses them i don't see it in there but a lot of you on your 401k plan when you do your 401k they will have a financial retirement planning tool for you which is a lot of these future value things and a lot of them use financial engines. At USAA, it was between financial engines and I can't remember the other firm. I wanted to use financial engines because it was started by William Sharp, who was the father of modern finance, Nobel Prize winner. And my staff said, you want to do that just because you want to talk to William Sharp? And I said, absolutely. That's why I want to interview that firm. Uh, but they do that. So you'll see this kind of advice You'll probably get this for free from your employer and your employer will give you, you put all your numbers in and they'll say, hey, you need to save this much. Or a lot of what they do is they have like these weather forecasts and say, based on what you're doing right now, you've got a 60% chance of meeting your plan. You're like, oh, that's depressing. Or you got a 92% chance. 
meeting your plans. They put inflation, all the stuff I showed you in the Carol's file, inflation and all those kind of things. They have, they'll have your social security in there. They have all kinds of things in there. The problem with these type of models is they assume if you're making $200,000 a year, that you're going to need 70% of that to live on when you retire. That didn't work for me because I lived really cheap. So I was living in neighborhoods that people were making like 10% of what I was making. And I felt really rich. This is actually my recommendation. When you make 80,000 move into a neighborhood, the average pay is 50. When you're making 200,000 move to a neighborhood, the average is 120. You'll just feel rich the whole rest of your life because it's just, you're making so much money everybody else. It reminds me of the story of this lawyer making a million dollars. That sounds like a decent pay, doesn't it? And his wife was really mad because they were so poor. Why were they so poor? Because they lived in a neighborhood where the average pay was 1.5 million. <laughs> they could have moved in the neighborhood where the average pay was 400,000, which is a really nice neighborhood. And she would have felt really rich. So that's the secret to, to wealth. And so that's the problem with these things. They assume you're, you're going to spend as much as your wealth. But if you're making a lot of money, you don't have to spend it all. You can just sock it away. Um, but those are the future value problems. We're going to be using this one quite a bit. We're going to price stocks. We're going to price bonds. Uh, we're going to do net present value. A lot of that type of problem we're going to just use over and over again. With net present value, we'll actually be using this one, but multiple times, but we're going to let Excel do all the work for us, all the heavy lifting, because we might have 20 future cash flows. And rather than having to do each one individually, Excel has a function to do all 20 of them for you just in a nanosecond. So we'll see that when we do that. Um, so you got to get comfortable with this. So let's... Let's see how smart y'all are. Y'all have already impressed me on the uh, multiple choice. Almost every, I think everything got Thursdays 100%. And then on the Tuesdays, the worst was four out of six, which I was really impressed. So I wasn't expecting y'all to do that well. Now, is that because your whole team gets it or was there one, like one person getting all the answers? So are y'all equal? I want, you don't have to answer that, but hopefully you're all getting it. Um, I've been looking at some of the papers and um, most of them were like 70, 80 percent there with a lot of struggle on working capital requirement. That's still still an issue for most people. Um, all right, let me give you a problem. And let's just just try it. So Mike wants to buy a house in 10 years, but he wants to save up the down payment. What's a typical down payment for a house? I don't know that either. I bought my house for cash, but 20%. So he goes out there and he goes, looks at houses and say, okay, the house I want today cost 250,000. He thinks housing inflation, I don't know, Andrew, how much housing inflation gonna be? If you looked historically, people think housing prices go up seven, eight, nine percent. They essentially kind of barely keep up with inflation. <laughs> they really don't do all that well. You think seven. So I think that's a little high, but um, but he wants to be conservative, right? He wants to so let, let's say five. Seven would probably be a little uh much for him. All right, so what does he need to do? So he, is this a present value problem or a future value? What is he doing? Is he Buying the house today, or is he saving for something in the future? In 10 years. So it's a future value. So the first thing is, what is his target portfolio? So the first thing is the future value is going to equal the present value times one plus the rate raised to the end. So what's the present value? So he thinks the house costs 250 today, right? So he thinks that's going to be 250. Oops, I didn't, I didn't hit those buttons, so I don't know why that happened. What's his rate? Well, he thinks inflation is going to be 5%. There's something wrong with this keyboard. Someone's been eating dairy products or something. <laughs> and what is his in? It's 10, all right? So what is he trying to do? This is a forecast. So he's trying to forecast. You'll be doing some of this when you do your, your uh, cost-benefit analysis. Because if you're doing a... Um, 
a franchise and you think your revenues are going to be 100,000 this year, they're going to grow with inflation. So you're going to keep inflating them every year. So there may be 102,000 the next year and 104,000 the next. So he's going to do that. So 250 times 1.05 raised to the 10th. So he thinks it's going to be 407,000. Andrew, you said 7%. That'd be 491,000. So now is inflation going to be exactly 5%? No. So he may have to make some changes. He may have to buy slightly lesser of a house. But how much is he saving? He's not saving 407,000. What is he going to save? The down payment. So he's going to save 20%. So he needs $81,444. All right. So the question is, how much can he invest that? So maybe he's going to put it all in the stock market. Can you put it in the stock market if you have a 10 year horizon? Be a little trick, risky, wouldn't it? But he could. The stock market will probably make about 8%. So he's going to go for it. So if he's going to make 8% and he's going to invest monthly. For how many years? 10 years. So what's his target? 81,444.73. And we don't have an in payment here. We have an investment. So you're going to take 81,444. You're not going to divide it by the present value because it's a future value. You're going to present dot divided by the future value. So what is his beginning balance? Zero. What's his investment earnings? So that doesn't really change. His investment earnings is going to be the beginning balance times his rate. So he'll make zero. His payment is now his investment. You see how the columns are the same? We just changed the titles. And what is his ending balance? Well, the nice thing here is if you're saving, you own everything, so you don't have to subtract anything. It's, it's all your money. So you just add everything across. That's the only difference in the two schedules. Everything else is exactly the same. We're going to go out how many months? 120. Does that look right? He's got his down payments after, after 10 years. And now, if the stock market doesn't make that, He's going to be really disappointed, but you can adjust every year, right? If the stock market falls 20%, you say, okay, I may have to wait till year 12 or I have to buy a cheaper house. Maybe housing prices have come down. I've noticed that with my mom's house. I sold her house in April and March, and those prices are already down quite significantly. So that they can drop. That could help them as well. Uh, mortgage rates are up, so that's maybe going to be a part of an issue here. He won't be able to afford that, that mortgage, but who knows? You plan and then you adjust as you go. Same thing with retirement. So, but he has a plan. That's the main thing is he has a plan. So on the invest 445, so he might set up a mutual fund where he just puts 445, 18 away in a month, every month, and just sits it and doesn't, doesn't worry about it. Some stock mutual fund out there uh, just invests every month. Uh, which mutual fund would you use? Well, I would probably go to Vanguard. I'm a huge Vanguard fan. Not only I, am I a Vanguard fan, but if you listen to a lot of investment podcasts, Vanguard comes up all the time and everybody loves Vanguard. I keep wishing one of my students would go work for Vanguard. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're up northeast where it's cold, so it's not the greatest place, but they're very much like USA it used to be, kind of this campus environment, small, kind of not massive like USA's gotten. Uh, very, what I love about them, very customer focused. One of the most customer focused firms. I love working with them. Oh my word. When I call them, they're, they're going to do whatever it took to make sure I was happy. Really, really good firm. Reminds me of Barclays. We had like a billion dollars of Barclays. And I say, oh, we're one of your big customers. And he's like, no, you're small to us. We have a lot bigger customers. I'm like you should have lied to me. I said, yeah, Mr. Sweet, you're one of our best customers. He didn't. You, I, you say that to Vanguard and they're like, yeah, you're our, you're our most important customer. I love Vanguard. I, what I love about Vanguard is they're owned by their customers 
And so their customers is only people they got to make happy and they do that extremely well. So a really, really good firm. And they probably have, they probably have jobs available out there. Um, right. So you got to get comfortable when you use these different functions. If you're in a future value problem or a present value problem, and sometimes it can be kind of a combination of, of different things. So the future value looks like this. This is what I did in the Carroll file where she invested for some, some time and then she drew out all the money at the very, very end. One thing I, I used an 8% return. That 8% return ignores taxes. Will he have to pay tax on this? Yeah, absolutely. So that's going to certainly hurt him. He can't put it in a Roth IRA because then he won't be able to take it out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of the challenge, but anyway, it's, it's, you got to make these assumptions. So I, he probably overstated on that. Um, if he can only make 5% after tax, then he's going to invest an extra hundred month, bucks a month to be able to get to his, his final plan. All right. Let me give you a scenario and you tell me what this is. Um, Bob wants to buy a boat today and he has $500 a week and use the loan payments. How much a boat can he buy? All right, this is sound like a future value or present value. Present value, there's really no future value in there at all. Um, so we have the function present value equals payment times the factor. Which of these numbers do we have? What are we calculating here? You have the payment, right? So here he just wants to know how much of a boat he can buy. So you're calculating that. So, so on the exam, you just got to figure out what am I giving you and where does it fit in these functions? So where I ride my bike, I saw a boat. It looked like a yacht. Man, that thing was massive. He couldn't even fit it in his driveway. It was, just, it was massive, massive, massive boat. I was tempted to ask him how much he paid for it. It was oh. ridiculous. It's, it's all yellow. It's his big, he must like yellow for some reason, just massive. Um, you're not going to buy that boat with $500 a month. That was, that was probably over a hundred thousand dollar boat. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Mary um, wants to pay for her daughter's college education with cash so she sets up a is it 501b plan i can't remember what is it college savings plan what are these 529 i was close i got the five right mm -hmm. Her daughter is two years old and wants to go to Dartmouth. All right, so how would she handle this? This is some present value or future value. It's all future. So where would she start? Where do you go to find out what Dartmouth costs in in 16 years? You must start with what? What it costs today? What is Dartmouth tuition? Really? <laughs> <laughs> but is but is does that include room and board? So she's got to take that in consideration. Um what about books? Is that 60,000 include books? It might. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You have to kind of think about it. 
Um, so, you know, that's what she's got to think about is, and then now college education ex inflation has been ridiculously high, hasn't it? Where could you get that? So here's something you're probably going to need to do on your project. Education, inflation, and then you just type the word Fred. Why Fred? That's the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. And they have all, I mean, once you click on it, they have all these numbers you can bring in. You don't need seasonally adjusted. And they show you college education inflation. If you want to look at it on a, you can edit a graph and you can do percentage change from a year ago. And they'll show you that. You can just see what it's been. So, it's been really, really high. That's tuition, tuition, other school fees, child care. It's a lot of other things in there. So this can be really powerful. You may have a project where you need gasoline prices. And you real quickly get, quickly get the history of it because you remember we're going to do sensitivity analysis. So you might want to say, well, what could gas price inflation be? It could be between this and this because that's what it's been historically. So this is a quick way. So what Mary could do is say, well, inflation has been as high as 7%. But as low as 2%, let me run scenarios and see what it could be. And that could certainly give her some indication. So, and then she needs that 60,000 per year. So she's gonna need enough money when her daughter turns 18 to be able to fund all four of those years. So she's got quite a bit, she's got to save up. It's probably gonna be half a million or more in dollars. Or she could do what I did. I went to UT Austin, lived at home. I, I applied at Baylor and Baylor lost my application. So I could have gone to Baylor and my parents could have paid for Baylor tuition and room and board. Instead, I went to UT Austin on a scholarship and stayed at home. My parents bought me a car because I saved them so much money. <laughs> so and that's what she could do. I know some parents that say, we'll pay for um, UT Austin or UTSA. If you want to go to anywhere else, you're paying the difference. Some parents have done that. UTSA is as good as Dartmouth and a lot cheaper. So why not do that? Right. I don't know how many of y'all live at home and go to school, but um, it's kind of like room and board is a big part of this, isn't it? That really increases the cost quite dramatically. Um, do y'all want to know what my tuition was? Any guesses on that? Think the opposite of what you did with the computer. No, per hour, per hour. Two hundred. Fifty bucks. Four dollars an hour. Wait, really? It was rare from for a semester to be over a hundred bucks for everything, including. Well, books might be a hundred bucks. So tuition and books together would, would never be more than a couple hundred bucks. So, yeah, so yeah. this inflate, I mean, it makes a big difference. So yeah, tuition has really grown dramatically here. I don't know what Austin, UT Austin is now, but it's much cheaper than, than Dartmouth. All right, so, you know, get some practice on this, but we're moving to a new topic here. All right. Can y'all whisper a little, a little quiet here? Uh, all right, so we're going to get into your projects. We might spend some class time with your teams, maybe next class or class after next, where you're going to make sure you decide on your project and then do some in-class um, planning on this. So cost-benefit analysis might be the single most important thing a firm does because what cost-benefit analysis is all about, it's about changing the firm. What they're currently doing, we're going to change it. So if you keep doing what you've always been doing, you don't have to do too many of these projects. These are projects where you're going to do something radically different to the firm to try to make it a better firm. So it's extremely important stuff. This is where you see the CapEx that we're talking about in your project. It's those large capital expenditures that somehow radically change the firm. And there's several types of these on the IT side. Do we build, do we create our own software? Or do we buy it? 
some software from a, an external vendor. At USA, I was involved in many of these projects and uh, not, not anything to IT majors, but they all went over budget, every single one of them. Uh, I remember when I first started, I remember sitting in a meeting with our life insurance company and they had something called the HAL project. I don't know if y'all remember HAL from 20,000 Leagues on there, whatever it is, there's a famous movie, but HAL, because it was life insurance, it was health, annuities, life. So they used HAL. Um, but it's also one letter sort of IBM. I don't know if y'all knew that, but HAL is one letter IBM. So, uh, so they, they thought it was great because it, it was an IBM project. And I remember the president of that company saying, you told me this project cost 10 million. Now you're saying it's 16 million. If this thing goes over 20 million, I'm setting it down. It was just like, it just keeps rising. That project was well over hundred million by the time they finished it. He retired, so he didn't see it go over hundred million, but that project just kept getting bigger. And what I noticed, and you IT people are gonna notice this, is um, when they're working on the project, they would ask the users, what do you need? And this person would see, um, I need this report. Say, well, that port, that's got a lot of numbers. And do you really need Yeah, I need that report. No one would ask why they need the report. So finally, someone says, why do you need that report? Well, because on page 622, there's one number I need. And someone says, well, maybe we could just give you that one number. And not, they were going to create this entire report. So they, the IT people got better about asking, why do you need that report? Maybe we could just give you what you need off of the report not give you that report, but it's it's frustrating. You're trying to develop this software. And most people are thinking, I need to do, do what it used to do. And you're, you're, you're kind of thinking, well, maybe you need to do something different, something in the future. Now, one thing that's changing here, I don't know about you IT uh, programmers, but how much AI is gonna write program language going forward? Is it gonna be 50% of it, 60% of it? If any of y'all use Python, probably 80% of your Python program, you're going to steal from the internet and you're just going to edit it. You know, that's so, and then AI might do the other 20%. So this world is changing quite dramatically. Um, I noticed there's only like one or two information tech. Most, most of the IT people are cybersecurity now, but firms still hire programmers, don't they? <laughs> they still need programmers, pretty important function. So the question is, do you do it yourself or do you hire something off the shelf? Um, if you have a product that's struggling, do you shut it down? Do you try to sell it to somebody else? Do you change it in some way? So one of the first projects I got from our CFO, I was just entry level. I've only been there for like eight, nine months. The CFO comes over and he says, I hate our health insurance product. I need you to do analysis so I can shut it down. So it wasn't an unbiased request. <laughs> he, he already told me the answer before I did the project. And our health insurance product was losing a lot of money. So I looked at it and what I discovered was it actually wasn't losing money, but they were allocating a lot of overhead to it. And what I discovered is if you shut this product, product down, we'd actually lose quite a bit of money because it was and the reason it was getting a lot of costs allocated to it is because it had a lot of people involved. It was a very people heavy project and a lot of our overhead costs were assigned based on personnel. So I went back to the CEO and said, yeah, if you shut this product down, we'll actually be less profitable as a firm. And so we fixed it. We just took a lot of their costs and allocated to another product line that never complained about allocated costs and that fixed it. But that was my, that was my assignment to figure out, is this a good product or a bad product? Um, and I was kind of worried going back to him because it was like he wanted me to make it look bad. But that's what I had to do with this product is figure out what are the true costs of this product and what are the costs of this product that wouldn't go away if we shut this product down. So you have to do that type of analysis. But if you say you're going to shut it down, do you actually shut it down or do you maybe sell it to another the company? And you see firms spinning off a of business all the time. You saw uh, Valero spin off Corner Store. Um, it was a very profitable business, but they spun it off and sold it to somebody else. And there was good reasons for doing that. Uh, if you're going to sell it to another firm, like USA sold their investment arm to Victory Capital, what price would you sell it at? So USA is going to try to find a really high price. Victory Capital is going to try to find a really low price. And the two of them will have to agree on what that price is. What if you're going to buy somebody else's product? 
how do you value that? This is what investment bankers do. If you become an investment banker, this is their thing. Um, people say investment bankers, they're like lawyers who do weddings and divorces. <laughs> they make money on the wedding and they make money, money on the divorce. And that's essentially what, what this is. You, you buy a product and then you sell it off later because it didn't work out. And the investment banker makes money on both sides. Mergers and acquisitions. So this is Brian's thing, right? Brian's our merger and acquisition uh, managing the director. He's talking about these firms that have merged and acquired other firms. I forget what you talked about this last time. It was Time Warner, Time Warner, or which T-Mobile. Oh, T-Mobile. Yeah, yeah. So there's been some really big ones, Exxon Mobil, some big mergers. Um, what's going to happen to the value firm? You do that. So here's where you use the word synergies. Have y'all heard that term? So you bring the two firms together and maybe you don't need 50 people in the accounting department. You know, both firms have 25 people in the accounting. So you combine it, maybe you only need 30. So you eliminate 20 jobs. And in, in Europe, they call these redundancies. These are expense savings. So that's synergy. You bring the two firms together and, and they're more valuable together than they were separate. Maybe, maybe because they don't have to have as many workers. Maybe they have markets they can take advantage of, of, of bringing two firms together. There's all different reasons for bringing two firms together. Sometimes it's pricing power. Exxon and Mobil, you bring two firms together and maybe they can raise their prices. And then that's when regulators get worried. Progress was trying to buy Albertsons. I don't know if they got it approved. Um, Regulators don't like this. Why don't the regulators like that? Because they're worried that's going to cause food prices to go up. Why do Kroger's and Appersons say, well, we're competing against Walmart, HEB, we got online. You know, our world's changing. We need more, we need more power. Um, so I don't know. If y'all any of y'all shopped at either one of these stores, Kroger's or Albertsons, there used to be Albertsons in San Antonio, but they all shut down probably more because of HEB, but Walmart as well. Um, so that's a big decision. Those are major, major decisions. Two firms coming together. That's when the investment bankers, oh, I forgot what you said. What did investment bankers make on the T-Mobile? How much does the bank investment bankers take? $150 million. Yeah, you make a lot of money as an investment banker. Uh, it's real stressful. A new product. Do you introduce a new product? What's, what is your competitors going to do if you do that? Um, yeah, so that's that's a, that's a major part of the products. So um, Apple, what's Apple going to do? That's going to be exciting. So they did the Apple Watch. I don't know how many of y'all have Apple Watches. I didn't think it would work, but you know the Fitbit thing and all that seems to be somewhat of a draw. Uh, but that's a major, major decision because it's going to be expensive to market it. You got to pick up market. You may be competing against a firm that's going to be pretty aggressive uh, on, on these kind of things. So, yeah, that's there's a lot of decisions you got to make, and it may end up being a real disaster. Uh, USA tried a product. Um, it sounded good to us. So USA has a lot of 70 and 80 year old drivers that shouldn't be driving. <laughs> so what USA said, hey, we'll we'll work out a deal with Uber, and we'll give you really cheap Uber rides if you'll stop driving. So you'll still cost you, but you'll save all this money on insurance, on gasoline. So if you'll stop driving and they said, well, the 80 year olds won't go far, but the 80 year olds kids will go far. So we'll market it to their kids. I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. That could work. And it didn't, didn't go over work very well at all. <laughs> didn't work. They shut her down, but uh, the lady promoting it, she got everybody excited. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So you try it, doesn't work and you shut it down. Outsourcing and insourcing. You know, outsourcing, you have somebody else do this for you. Insourcing, you bring it back in. Um, some firms do that every five years. They outsource something, and then five years later, they bring it back in-house, and then they outsource and bring it in-house. Um, so what we did at USA was centralizing. So when I, was, when I started at USA, USA, every subsidiary had their own accounting function, their own cash handling function, their own treasury. They all had their own departments. And when Joe Robles came in, he had a big project with E&Y. 
and they decided to centralize all of that. And, and so instead of having six departments doing financial statements, they had one big department doing everything. Instead of having six cash handling departments, they just had one big department. Uh, saved a lot of money, um, but some of the CFOs said, we don't like that because we're not gonna be so close to our business. No, we want, we want someone who just, just handles the bank. So that was the big debate. But it did save USA a lot of money. They're still in doing that today. Um, they did that with auditing as well and, and other areas. Um, and the bad news is um, I used to know the head of these departments, they've all retired. So I was really good at getting my students jobs in those two departments, uh, the accounting and the auditing, but they've unfortunately retired. I don't know anybody, but pretty soon one of our alums will be the head of that department and we'll, I'll be able, I'll be back in power again. I, I always, every time I see them retire, it's like, oh, who am I, I going to reference my students to? Uh, marketing projects. Some of you are marketing majors. Marketing projects frequently have cost-benefit analysis. So you have um, kind of the, the response rate that you're thinking about, the hit rate, the click rate, whatever you're looking at. What is it going to do to your sales? So if you're in some of these projects are massive, I've seen $50 million marketing projects. Uh, what is it going to do? How much more business are you going to get from these kind of things? Um, so yeah, it's, and then what is your competitor going to do? How are they going to react to that particular marketing take? So um, I don't know what marketing is like today. I think it's more stats and AI than it is anything else. It's becoming more of a math my thing. If I were a marketing major, I'd probably get an applied math master's degree, graduate degree, because it's just becoming very, very mathematical. Um, the marketing department USA was, they had three PhDs in math in that department. Just brainy, brainy, brainy people. Um, but you have to do that type of analysis because it really is very data-driven type of, type of stuff. But I, my guess is AI is really becoming a major, major part of, of marketing departments. Risk management is a tough one. So risk management, if you do a cost-benefit analysis, if you're auto insurance, it's always going to come out as a negative number. Insurance is always a losing proposition. So when you buy auto insurance, you're going to pay a whole lot more than you're expecting to get back in claims. Why? Because the loss ratios are usually like 70%, which means when you pay $100 for auto insurance, on average, you expect to get $70 back in claims because they have $20 in expenses, $10 in profit. So when you buy insurance, you know you're losing money on average. Now, you may be lucky to have a big auto accident right away and get all your money back, or you buy life insurance and you, know, you, you die right away, then you make a lot of money. But on average, the insurance company is going to bring in more money than they're going to pay you. So that means risk management projects always have negative net present value. So you have to analyze, I'm not saying you should buy auto insurance, you should, but what I tell my, my insurance classes is people buy way too much insurance. They overbuy it. I was telling my class last night, I don't buy part B and C of auto. I think it's a complete waste of money. It's about $150 a month, a year. I think it's a waste of money. I can find a much better place to buy insurance than there. Why? Because if I pay the 150 bucks, I know on average I'll get back a lot less than 150 bucks. So I'm just wasting money. Uh, same thing with warranties, right? Warranties is somewhat of a risk management project. I remember I bought a, a black and white TV, it was seven inch TV, so it was $16. And I take it up to the front and they want to sell me a warranty for seven bucks. So you're, you're, you're kidding me, right? Who would pay seven bucks for a warranty on a $16 TV? I, I told him I'd drop it on the, in the parking lot and just come back and buy another one. You know, it's, who, why would I do that? It doesn't make sense. I don't buy that kind of stuff. There are times though, where it does make a lot of sense. And when does it make sense for low frequency, high severity? This is the only time you buy, you spend money on risk management projects. Things that have a very low probability of happening, but when they happen, they, they're really painful. Like life insurance for a 20 year old. Very low probability that a 20 year old is going to die, but if they do, it could be really serious for their family, really severe. That's when it makes sense. Auto insurance. It's very unlikely 
well, you're a 20 year old, so maybe it's a little more likely you have an auto accident, but it's still, you're not having an auto accident every year. You know, hopefully once every 10 years, if even that. Low frequency, but when it happens, it's pretty expensive. So that's part D of auto insurance. But parts B and C, I think it's complete waste of money because you're already paying for insurance for that. You're just paying insurance twice. Doesn't make sense. Health, health insurance is a good example of buying insurance for high frequency, low severity. Doesn't make any sense. But most of y'all will do this. Buying insurance for doctor's visits. You go to the doctor once a year and it costs you hundred bucks. You say, I don't want to pay hundred bucks. I'm going to buy insurance. And insurance says, okay, that's fine. We'll charge you $130 to cover that doctor's visit. Does that make sense to pay $130 in insurance to cover your hundred dollar doctor visit? That's what dental insurance is. You spend $130 on dental insurance to cover that hundred dollar dinner visit, dental visit. What should you do? Just pay for it out of pocket. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of insurance where it's a complete waste of money you shouldn't do. So you really want to limit to those things that don't happen often. And when they happen, uh, they're really, really severe. Why not happen often? Because when if they're low frequency, it means it doesn't cost the insurance company much. They don't have all that much volume. They don't have to hire a lot of people. If you go to a life insurance company, their client claim staff is like two or three people. They don't get, it's not that high volume, fortunately, right? People aren't dropping dead all the time. Um, so I keep some of their costs down and that means it's, it's a pretty good deal for you on, on the investing side. So you wanna make sure, and I was funny asking my class last night, I said, well, do y'all buy part B and C of auto insurance? And they don't know. <laughs> so, okay, you're paying 150 bucks a year for something you don't even know if you have it. Uh, and they weren't even sure if they needed it. It's like, you never do that with insurance. <laughs> You know what you're paying for, what, how much you're paying. There's something called rate online you should look up, which is the most important part with insurance. So there are times where risk management makes a lot of sense. But it's still going to be a negative net present value. But the bang for the buck, the amount of risk it reduces, you don't have to worry or not, you know, like your homeowner's insurance. If your home burns down, that would be really severe. The fact that you're going to pay a little extra homeowner's insurance is pretty cheap relative to the risk you're covering. Yeah, why not spend that, that get that off, the, off your table? Um, so none of you are gonna do this for your project because the net present value will always be negative. It just doesn't make sense, but it still makes sense to do this because of the risk reduction for you. Tax savings opportunities, there are a lot of those. The IRS, the tax code, I think is 10,000 pages long now, it's just ridiculous. Uh, those do come up. There's one that, I, that came up at USA. We looked at it and boy, it had a really high value. It was really positive, but we didn't take it to the CEO because we knew he wouldn't take it. Um, it was one related to, um, it was, if you treat coal, the IRS gives you this big tax benefit, but the law wasn't written real clearly. They meant treat coal to make it less pollutive, but they forgot to put that part in the law. So what these firms discovered was if you just treat coal with chemicals, you get the tax deduction, even though it does nothing for the environment and firms were taking these massive tax deductions. The IRS hated it, but the law was written real clearly and they had, they couldn't do anything about it. So why didn't we, it was worth like 80 million bucks to USA. Why didn't we take it to CEO? Because the headline risk was terrible. We didn't want a headline USA of avoiding taxes, you know, it was, it looks so horrible, right? That's pretty terrible. You're taking advantage of a loophole in the law. To, and so we didn't, we said, we're just going to take it to the CEO, but you'll see those type of opportunities. You got to be careful because there are some CPAs that are sitting in jail right now because they got a little too aggressive on these kind of things. So you do have to be careful. Some, I need all tax uh, accounting majors that want to be tax, tax accountants. Okay, I mean, it's, I know some people who love that kind of thing. I have my, one of my best friends, she was the head of taxes at USA. Just, oh, she was wonderful. Her whole department, USA, if you're going to do tax, go to USA. Their tax department is just the best. I just love those guys. They hated seeing me coming because it was always these complicated problems. But, oh, they would do the best research. And she loved it. She was more of a lawyer than a tax accountant because it was looking up these legalized legalese that you have to really read into. 
that those things are out there. There are times when you make a decision driven by the tax code, but you have to be careful because the IRS doesn't like you doing things solely for tax reasons. And what the tax department told me, I said, well, we're kind of doing it for other reasons. And he said, yeah, but if you're, on, you're under oath, are you going to tell them that the tax reason wasn't the number one reason why you were doing this? And I said, no, I don't want to spend 50 years in jail. So, okay, let's not do it. A new collections process. We dealt with this at USAA. USAA started letting their members pay by credit card. That's horrible because credit card transaction fees are really high. Why did they do it? Well, because there was a certain segment of the membership that just wanted to pay by credit card and you just had to allow them to do it, cost money. Um, so that was float. We'll talk about float um, maybe later in this. If you can do it in a way that you get your money a week earlier or two weeks earlier, that can be really valuable to you. Websites. Um, Firms spend a fortune on their websites. Uh, some firms do this and they don't do any cost benefit analysis at all. They just consider it cost of doing business. You just got to spend a million dollars every year on the website. Now, this is getting much, much, much better. It's amazing. Some of these um, these firms, I can't remember the names of them, like Twilio or some of that, I can't remember, but um, for $50 a month, and I don't mean for an individual, for an entire business. If you got a business, you got a franchise for 50 bucks, you can get some pretty sophisticated stuff. You can text your customers, you can email your customers. I don't know why my off my doctor's office doesn't do that. They still call to tell me about uh, appointments. It makes no sense to me. For 40, 50 bucks a month, they could do this. So there's stuff you can do uh, using out, 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 outside sources that really make that better. I, I business decision tool. Um, the problem here is the benefits. So we're gonna have we're gonna spend uh, the project I was involved with was three hundred thousand bucks. We're gonna spend three hundred thousand dollars on this tool that's gonna help us make better decisions. And then they say, "What's your what's your benefit?" I say, "I don't know. It depends on what decisions we make." Um, that tool saved USA over a billion dollars in two thousand eight. So it paid for itself. It was massive. It was pretty amazing. But we didn't know that going in. And they tried to get it reapproved, and they couldn't get it reapproved, even though it proved itself. They couldn't get any more money for it. So, and then regulatory issues. We'll talk a little bit more about these. Um, a lot of people say, "Hey, if the regulators require it. We're just going to do it." But there are ways you can do it uh, cheaper, more efficiently. And I know some people who say, "Just don't do it. We'll just pay the fine because it's such a ridiculous regulation." So, these are kind of things you're talking about. Using doing a cost benefit analysis about. Um, I'm going to jump down here to talk about the type of decisions. So there's some decisions you got to make where you just have to do it. So OSHA comes out and say you got to do certain things for your workers. Yeah, so in those those probably get. So the, the issue most firms have is how to prioritize these projects. And so required ones, they get moved up pretty fast. You got to do it. Just do it. How much is it going to cost? But again, it's, it's possible. You just say don't do it and pay the penalties. Uh, I remember one student, uh, San Antonio had a uh, saws came out with penalties for watering your grass during the summer. And this student said, I just kept watering my grass. I'll, I'll pay. I'll pay the penalties. And he said, "I don't care because I paid so much money on my yard. I'm, I'm just going to ignore it and do it. And hopefully, my neighbors don't turn me in." That was his decision. I don't know what the penalties were, but that's what he said. So that's that's possible. Um, cost savings are usually the ones firms like the best. First of all, um, you usually see the benefit pretty quickly, and secondly, they're the easiest to forecast. Some of y'all might do a cost savings type of, of project. So buy a uh, an EV or buy a hybrid or buy a plug-in hybrid, which is what I have now. But 
those are that's a cost saving. You're saving gasoline. Now, I just saw an article that says in some places it's more expensive to use electricity and gasoline. I don't. It's not true for me with buying because San Antonio electricity is still pretty cheap. But in some places in the country, it's actually costing them more to charge their car than it would to be buy gasoline um, because gas prices have really dropped pretty dramatically. Um, but that's that's the kind of analysis you got to do. You got to make sure there are savings. So you can't spend two thousand dollars and it doesn't save you money, right? So you got to make sure there's savings there. For our projects, there also has to be an upfront cost. All right, so this would not work. Um, oh, I forgot the name of it. Cancel Comcast. I know what's that called? They have um. So I haven't used it ever. What is it? Um, I just completely forgot. Um, not the internet. Oh well, man, I just lost. But you you cancel your TV subscription, whatever that is. Cable. Thank you. You cancel cable. Why doesn't that work as a cost benefit analysis? There's no upfront costs. <laughs> right? You just call and cancel it. You save money. Should you do that? Well, yeah. If, if you're not watching, I, only time I watch TV is when I go stand. I'm in a hotel. And I'm just sitting there like this, like I can't believe anyone's paying for cable. There's nothing good other than SUV, SVU, you know, Law and Order is the only thing I watch. And I can I can binge watch Law and Order. But other than that, there's nothing on TV. Sometimes I'll have um, replays of old football games. I can watch those forever. It could be two two college teams. I don't care about either one of them. And I'll watch it because it's just so fun. But that's about the only time. And I'm, there's no way I'm going to spend whatever it is, $50 a month for that. Um, so that doesn't work. So you have to have some upfront costs. If EVs are cheaper than gas cars and are cheaper than the run, that doesn't work either. So you can't spend less today and then save money in the future. That's kind of like an obvious thing to do. And EVs may be getting to that point where they're going to be cheaper to buy and cheaper to maintain. So you have to have some upfront costs and then some kind of savings. But that's a pretty common one for cost benefit analysis. <laughs> Now, Brian was asking about one that I've seen done before, and that is the corporate jet. So USA had a corporate jet. I wanted to do the cost benefit analysis and they wouldn't let me do it. It was a pet project of the CEO and they didn't want to know. It's like, hear no evil, see no evil. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it to say we should get rid of the corporate jet. I just want to know how much it's costing us. Now, USA uses corporate jet really, really, really well. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't Maryland's where they they had a, a corporate helicopter that did nothing but fly around and find golf courses for the CEO. USA put its rank and file employees on it to fly them to uh, their, their regional offices. It saved hotel costs. It obviously saved uh, the cost of airlines. And then there was just the savings of, you know, you get back to your families. So kind of that family times, so all of that was important. I remember one trip, we visited three cities in one day. If we'd done that by commercial, we would have been a three-day trip. We did it all in one day. And in fact, we were looking at three banks. We're trying to figure out which bank we're going to hire. We had our committee meeting on the corporate jet on the way home. And we had our decision. We got home and my boss was on his laptop building the PowerPoint. So we got home, had the PowerPoint. The next day we presented it and we had our approval. That's pretty efficient use of time. My boss was a VP. So, you know, can you justify that? It's probably going to be a, a little bit tricky, but there may be enough there to justify that. And boy, was it cool to ride the corporate jet. It was really nice to drive up 10 minutes before the plane leaves, get out of your car, get on the plane. And when you land, there's a van waiting for you. That was really sweet, <laughs> but uh, it, very expensive. USA's jets, oh my word, they were expensive. And have, have y'all seen USA's hangar at the, at the airport? <laughs> you'll notice it. You'll see crummy building, crummy building, crummy building. USA crummy building is this mausoleum. It's just incredible. So USA probably not uh, cost benefit justified. What other projects could y'all do? Um, one example I give you is um, you buy a buy a house near a, near your your child's uh, college. 
they stay in that house rather than staying in a dorm and you sell the house four years later when they graduate. Would that make more sense than using a dorm? That's a perfectly good, you're saving the dorm cost, plus you can lease out some of that house to other students, you know, those kind of things. Um, customer service ones, these are kind of tricky because finance doesn't really care if the customers are happy. They just want more revenue, lower turnover, those type of things. So that can be tricky. Uh, so what does Netflix do to make their customers happy? Is it new shows? How much does that cost them? Billions of dollars. Is that getting them new customers or, or is that just retaining the ones they already have? You know, I don't know what Netflix costs now. Is it $15 a month now? So, so they're, they're getting up there. It used to be, you know, five or six. Yeah, they've gotten real strict about people sharing sharing their account. Which makes sense. I don't think Hulu is doing very well, but um, and we'll see what Disney does with Hulu. Uh, I used to switch between Netflix and Hulu, and now I'm just like, there's nothing to watch anymore. Uh, I binge watched 24 that season, the second season, and then the third season. I'm like, if his daughter gets kidnapped one more time, <laughs> I just I can't take it anymore. So you know that's expensive. That's billions of dollars, and what are you getting on the other side of that? That's I think that's what Disney and Netflix and Hulu are. are I don't know if Hulu has any, um, did they do any production? I don't know, but uh, very, very expensive. That's a lot of money. Do they have some original? Yeah. yeah, so you gotta attract people there. They're probably still cheaper than Netflix, but um, so that's that's a lot of customer service. Um, a lot of times customer service is to reduce turnover or reduce churn. That's something that's very measurable. You can definitely see what your churn was now and what is it going to be here. What do you think about airlines? What can airlines do so you'll use their airlines and not the other one? So what's, your, what's the only thing you care about on an airline? It's what? Oh, so cost, right? Do you worry about the, the schedule? I take a group of students to Costa Rica every year. Schedule becomes real important there because I got 10 people and so I always use United because they have the best schedule. Fortunately, their airfare is pretty competitive. Um, people tell me you always should use uh, Mexican airlines. Yeah, but I have to stay overnight in Mexico City. I don't want to take 10 students. I have to go get to a hotel and all that. You know, so there's other things. But price tends to be the most important thing. Um, now, I know now Delta and United, they now have online, on, on flight TV and all that. Now it's free. You don't have to pay for it anymore. Is that enough to get you to use that airline? Do you care about that? Uh, Spirit Airlines charges you a know, fortune for check bags and all those kinds. But, but even after that, they're still a lot cheaper. You know, that's what you have to think. Airlines have to think about that. The biggest problem with airlines is what if they spend and then competitors copy? So y'all know these terms, you marketing majors know. Y'all know the early mover and late mover? Y'all know the difference in those two? So the early mover does it first, grabs all the customers and somehow keeps them. What does the late mover do? They say, I'm going to watch and see how this goes for United. If it works, we'll copy it. If it doesn't work, we just won't do it. So there's an advantage to each one. <laughs> And so you have to decide the key with the early mover is what we call economic moat. You have something that keeps the competition out. So you don't want to do something that attracts customers and then your competitors just copy it and you lose them back. That would be, a, you're spending all this money and your, com com your competitors just watching and learning. So you have to sum. So that's really, really important on these type of things. These customer service things, it's got to work and it's got to work for an extended period of time. <clears throat> now, let's take kiosk at McDonald's. Is that cost savings or is that customer service? Or is it both? Could be both. Would you pick McDonald's because of a kiosk? Um, I was at the general, the corner store today and the line was 10 deep 
Um, and I was at a dollar, dollar store yesterday and I noticed they had a self-checkout and there was some in line where someone had self-checkout too. I love H-E-B self-checkout, um, but Walmart has it too. So it doesn't really do anything for me. So sometimes you can do both and that's, that's great if you can do both. So I had one team last year, they did a kiosk at H-E-B pharmacy. And that was their question is it will save us time because they wouldn't have to hire as many people, but it might actually pick us up some business. So you have to think about that. That would be the perfect project if you could do both of those at, this, at the same time. The restaurant we started in uh, Costa Rica, um, the people we deal with there, their house is right next door and they have the best Wi-Fi ever. And so we just offer free Wi-Fi. And everybody comes in, that picks us up business because we're in a place where there is no Wi-Fi. And so the entire, the entire you know 10 mile radius is coming just to get free Wi-Fi. They may only buy a cup of coffee, but a cup of coffee is a cup of coffee. That's more business. It, it works. So if you can find a project like that, that's that's like ideal. Expansion overseas, those kind of things. Those are major, major projects. Those you've got to really, really make sure you, you have an entire staff that does that. And then diversification, moving to different projects sometimes. And I think, Brian, you're probably going to talk about this. You can do um, lateral or vertical, you can buy a competitor, or you can buy a supplier, or you can move into an entirely different market. Those kind of things are gonna make sense. All right, so what I wanna do, have your teams talked at all about your project yet? And you're, yeah, you're in business projects. All right, so I'll probably then next Tuesday, we're gonna break in the teams and we're gonna really get into your projects. We'll use the the class time it's not goof off time though i really want y'all because you got to get this done all right so turning your projects on friday i'm going to kill myself getting them graded so i can get back to you with detailed comments and then you have a whole week to get ready for the exam so we can use next week kind of a cooling time to work to get work on your projects so your projects due tomorrow um, my goal is to grade five tomorrow 15 saturday and uh five on sunday it's going to take me a while because i'm giving you a lot of comments some of you are if you're struggling set up a zoom with me tomorrow in the morning if your project's a little late it's not a big deal i'd rather have a good project uh, i'm worried on a, you know the ones i've seen have generally been pretty good but if you know if you're struggling and trying to catch up it's, it's a pretty massive undertaking to try to get done in a short period of time uh, people have asked several have asked about tutorials financial analysis is um uh, everybody does it differently so if you go to tutorials it's gonna be somebody else's approach and it's just gonna be frustrating uh-huh uh, we'll we're gonna be able to fix them on you can fix two things on the project but yeah you have the comments before the exam uh i'll probably send you each individually an excel file that has the rubric with comments by each piece and then you can pick which two to fix. Um, but yeah, it's financial analysis. Everybody does it a little bit differently. So there's no one place to go that does it the same. But um, your your best bet, probably at this point, if you're struggling one part of the paper is go back to the class videos and watch what I'm doing on Walmart while you're doing your company. That's probably the best because if you go try to watch someone's video, I, I set Andrew, and sent Andrea two links one of them didn't even mention margins. <laughs> All right, well, if y'all need help set up, you, you know, you can make corrections, but you can't correct everything. So if you wanna go through it tomorrow, uh, I get really tired because if you wanna do the entire thing, it's it's a lot. That's why I was saying, do it as we go so we can hit the section as we go. Cause I, but I'll, I'll give you whatever you need, but I can, I can get pretty worn out. It's a long paper, it's a lot to go through. So the best is to highlight the sections you're really struggling with and get the easier ones out of the way. All right, so we're gonna do something where essentially you're gonna get this twice. So you've got a YouTube that walks you through this, but I wanna do it in class because this is really, really critical. This is something almost everyone in this room is going to have to do, and you'll probably do it early, early in your career. So it's really pretty critical stuff. And that's just doing a basic uh, cost benefit analysis in Excel from scratch, and so what I've done, and we're going to walk through this and then you'll see it in the video. So today, if you want to try to keep up with me in Excel, that's fine. But I wouldn't worry too much about it because you have a YouTube that does it as well. 
I want you to see the bigger picture of what Excel is trying to accomplish for you, how to set up a good Excel file analysis so that other people can use it and understand it. So this is a real life case. This is an actual case I worked on when I was at USA. Got it approved, got it implemented. It's a cash handling case. What cash handling means is people mail in checks and payments, mainly checks, and USA's process it. So is there a way we can do that more efficiently, do it faster? Um, so let me give you the background on it. I wish I had um, Carol here, here to talk about it. Carol Walls, I worked with the USA. She was really, really good at this. She may be retired. Her son actually took my class a few years ago, several years ago. Uh, he invited me to his wedding, but I never got the message. So, uh, sorry, I missed it. Um, but Carol Walls, she runs cash handling at USA. She handles all the easy stuff. This process is about the messy stuff. So in Carol's department, and I don't know what they do today because check processing has changed so dramatically the last five, 10 years. But what she did back then is they would have a bunch of checks come in. USA has you know, millions of customers, so they, they could get several thousand checks come in. Well, that's a lot of envelopes to open, a lot of checks to read. You have to encode them so you can send it to the bank. Well, Carol has machines that could open 40,000 of those an hour, could read them. They could actually read the check amount, could match that against the invoice. And if everything matched, it would encode it and put it, process it. I mean, she was doing tens of thousands an hour. Pretty amazing. Really, really fast. Um, and their error rate was just almost, I mean, her success rate was like 99.999%. I mean, very, very, very few errors. Um, but there's another process. It's a new thing came along called bank bill pay. Some of y'all may use this. I don't know any of y'all use your bank bill pay. So the way it worked back then is the customer went online and said, hey, I want you to pay USAA. And they'll say, okay, great. Give me the address. So you give them the address, give them the account number and say, pay USAA. And then that person's thinking, wow, I just converted everything to electronics. That's wonderful. But that's not what they did. The person they went to, through, maybe it's check free, maybe it's their banks. Their bank would then print a check, put it in the envelope and mail it to USAA. I remember Carol's area could process 40,000 checks an hour. But this new process, this bank is printing this check in an envelope that Carol can't read, doesn't have an invoice she can read. So it goes from being a very fast automated process to being very manual. So, and I actually watched this process. It was three people. They're opening checks one at a time, looking at the check, looking at the payment, trying to figure out what was going on. They were processing maybe 30 or 40 an hour. I mean, it's real slow. And I was watching, I was talking to one lady while she was doing it. And she picks up one check. Oh, this isn't ours. This belongs to the life insurance company. I go, well, how do you know that? He goes, oh, we get that one every month. It's wrong. And so but she had it memorized. She hated that job. I could tell uh, it was just a very, very manual job. And then our customers get mad because we don't process their payments very fast. They're thinking, hey, I did this electronically. Why is my payment not processed yet? Well, it's because we had to open it manually and there's errors. It's going to the wrong company. You don't want to send your life insurance premium to the auto insurance company. That doesn't make sense. And so then they have to send it back over there. It was a mess. And so the goal of this project was to see if we could find some way working with these banks that do this, that instead of them sending us checks and envelopes, they could send, 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 us, send us an electronic file and do everything electronically. And the firm that was the largest, I think they're still around, is a firm called Check Free. Kind of, you can tell from their title. So Check Free was the biggest, biggest volume that we had. And so we called Check Free and we said, hey, we want a project. We're going to convert something that's very manual and make it, make it all electronic. Mm -hmm. So it's going to cost us up from because there's some programming that the, the systems people have to do. Um, but 
the savings is going to work. We're going to save those three people that were working in the department. We don't need them there. They can go back to Carol's area and, Car and you know, I think they're going to lose their jobs, but they really won't lose their jobs because Carol's department had so much turnover. She would just move them back to the other area and they would have been fine. There's, someone's going to lose their job, but they'll never know it. It's just someone she would have never hired. She's not going to actually let these people go. So, and they would have been much, they, they wanted to be back in her department anyway, because they didn't like what they were doing here. It's really, really tough. But a lot of errors, a lot of incompletes. I actually called some of the customers that were doing this uh, and they they were frustrated to say, why does it take y'all so long? You know, there's errors, all these kind of things. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to convert these. And so here's the assumptions. We'll work on the assumptions page. But when you think about Excel, so something you have to be really aware of is Excel is open architecture. So it's all up to you how you're going to build it. It's a lot of rows and columns it's really wonderful because once you put something in there you can reference it you don't have to keep typing it that's really really nice it's one of the things i grade on on this particular project and what's important about this particular uh application is it's going to be really important for your team projects because the excel is actually a big part i think it's 40 percent of the grade of your team projects so you want to get the excel very very well set up so i do want some this to be somewhat of an excel training to make sure you're comfortable with excel but Excel is open architecture, so no controls. There are a lot of errors in Excel that get through. I remember early in my career, we we're walking into a final presentation with my boss's 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 boss. And like five minutes before we left, I found an error in the Excel. He goes, sorry, boss, we got to change some of the numbers. And she's like, wow, why did, I hope, how do you know the new numbers you just plugged in in the last five minutes? How do you know those are right? Is it, yeah, I don't, but we got, this is what we're going with. She's like, I'm still good friends with her. But yeah, at that point, she wasn't real happy. Um, and so that's one of the things a lot of CFOs don't like about Excel is there can be a lot of errors. When I created this problem, I had my friend, remember that the lady from Texas, my good friend, I gave her the case, she worked it and I worked it and we both got different answers. We got different answers and we both had errors. <laughs> so I was going, wait, what did you do? Oh wait, you keyed the wrong number here. She's, oh yeah, but you keyed the wrong number there. And once we fixed our errors, we had the same answer. But so it's really easy to make errors in Excel. So you, you really, and that's one of the reasons on your team projects, we're going to have an Excel only meeting where you're going to send me your Excel and I'm going to look for all those errors. We're going to try to fix them. I, I find a lot of errors in Excel because um, that's kind of my thing. Um, so in Excel, what you want to do is you want to make it user friendly. So the best way to think about Excel is you build this model. They do the project and then seven months later, someone says, well, wait a minute. This project's not going. What, what were y'all assuming? And so you get this phone call and they say, hey, can you send us the file you did? And you're like, OK, what did I call it? Where did I put it? So you send it to them. They open it up. They have no clue what you did. It's just formulas all over the place. It's a mess. It's not what you want to do. So what you want to do is you want to build. You want to build logic as you go. Very, very important when you're doing Excel takes a little more time, but you want to document as you go. You want to make it really, really obvious. So you're going to see some things that I do. You might have comment boxes. You might have a column for explanations or sources. Now, I'm excessive here, but I love it. I do this a lot. I like the hyperlink do a lot of hyperlink my charity. I have a spreadsheet. I don't know how many sheets it has, but it's well over 200. If I had the page down, page down or go to the index, it'd take me forever. So I have links so I can jump right to where I need to go. Um, so you want things clearly labeled. You want assumptions 
clearly linked to logic and rationale and source. What you don't want is someone to load your spreadsheet and go, well, wait, why were you assuming that? You go, oh, well, there it is right there. See what you're assuming. Even worse is you don't want to pull up the spreadsheet seven months later and you don't remember what you did. Yeah. It's like, okay, and I've had that happen some um, there's, uh, there's several times I built a spreadsheet thinking, okay, I'm done. And then they call me six months later. It's like, I, I didn't think we'd, I'd ever have to look at this thing again. So now I'm trying to figure out what did I actually do? Um, so you want to document as you go. Yeah. It takes a little more time, but it really helps. You want to have a sheet or an overview of the project. So when you load up the Excel, it says this project, the goal of this project is there. Here's the sponsor. Here's who built this. Put your name and number in there. Who the sponsor is, uh, when the project was done, those kind of things. So if someone loads this up again, even, even a year or two later, they'll say, okay, I see why we did this. Especially if you're doing a you know, massive, massive project, $10, $20 million. And people are thinking, why did you assume such a high number? And you go back, all that's documented. You don't have to start over from scratch. Then you definitely want a page of assumptions. Very, very important. The key on the assumption page is it's all in one place. Why is that important? Because if you need to change an assumption, you need to go to one spot and change the assumption and it flows everywhere else. I count off a lot of points on your project if I see key numbers in your analysis. All the key numbers need to be in your assumptions page. Once you get to the actual analysis, it also be referencing the assumptions, all right? You don't wanna have key numbers because then if, if you need to change that number, you don't know how many different places you keyed it. So you only wanna keyed one time. So if you need to change it, so if you're using an inflation rate of 3%, you wanna have an assumption that says inflation, it says 3%. And then you have a base case and you see, you see this formula. You see it referencing that. What you don't wanna see is it going that times 1.03. Because if you need to change the 3%, what do you have to do? Every cell that's one, that times 1.03, you gotta change every single one of those cells. You, what you want to do is every time you're using 3%, it references that particular spot. Very, very, very important. And you can have links to more detailed analysis. So a good example on your project, we talked about it last class. Let's say you need gasoline inflation. You need an assumption for gasoline. Maybe you're doing a hybrid car. And so part of your analysis is you're going to go out to the Federal Reserve and you can actually get historical and gasoline inflation. Well, that might be a whole separate sheet where you have all this analysis. And at the very end, you have your final assumption. I'm not good at chat. OK, so you might want to put all analysis on one sheet. And then on your assumptions page, you reference that detailed analysis and you see exactly where you got it. Then when someone comes up and says, how'd you get the inflation? You say, oh yeah, you, you looked at the last 50 years. Your, uh, your assumption was 3%, but your ranges were negative four to positive 12 based on his, historical range, you know, that kind of thing. So you have some basis for that. So you can have links and more details. So you wanna be careful on the assumptions page is that it's just not overwhelming. Right. Well, I don't like, I have some students that have stuff here and they have stuff here, they have stuff over here. You know, you almost have to just to figure out what they're doing. I just have to go like this. It's like, okay, what's, there's something over here. What's, what's that? It's better if you have something over here, put it on a different sheet and label it. All right. So these are the kind of things I'm looking for with your project. Then you run your, your analysis. And this is where you're going to have a base, best, worst, and break even. So y'all are gonna do these, these four cases, base, best, worst, and break even. Uh, and they're all gonna reference back. So that means your assumption page has to have the base, best, worst case assumptions. And I'll show you how we'll do that. In this particular one, there's only one thing we're doing the analysis, the scenarios on. And then you need some kind of summary chart 
and we'll talk about the summary chart. What would you put in a summary chart? That's for the decision maker. When you finish the project, you might move the summary chart up to the second thing instead of having it at the end, but that's easy to do in Excel. You just move it around, right? And so what I grade on your team project is when I load your Excel, how, how hard is it for me to figure out what you did? If, if I'm seeing a formula that's going on, you know, 80 characters and referencing all different kinds of, you know, it's better to break stuff up sometimes instead of having multiple, multiple formulas and massive formulas. All right. So we're going to start with the overview. And you can put some description in, in there. This project is assessing whether we should automate our bill pay clients with check free by writing a program or whatever, you know, the summary. You want to be fairly clear here. You notice I said check free here. My project wasn't the automate check free and Bank of America and Citibank, and this project was only focused on check free. If it works, then they might go and do the others as well. And hopefully the software they write will work for the others, but every bank's a little different. So I'm real clear, this is only related to check free. All right, I got the project sponsor. So that was Terry. I even remember his last name, I won't put it in there, but sponsor without um, the date that we did it. He contacts, so it could be you know, Nancy, Bob, phone numbers, those kind of things. I realize that stuff changes. Some of you put their emails or anything. So because you do this project and then you quit and go somewhere else. It's like, oh, well, oh my word, uh, so-and-so left and we don't have this. So you load up the spreadsheet. Oh, I, let's talk to Nancy. Maybe she'll know what, what they were doing, that kind of thing, all right? So you wanna make it clear. Firms waste a lot of time building this stuff and it's just not well documented at all, all right? And then we're gonna build our assumptions. So the way you want to do your assumptions, this is in the case. So I've given you the assumptions. So you have the assumption. Now, here's something your team's going to want to think real carefully about is portrait or landscape. Generally, people like to have years go across. And so if you're going to have an assumptions, you know, be, be real careful. Um, and this one is not that critical, but I'll, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet I built for a franchise. Um, and on franchises, a lot of times you'll you'll actually build assumptions across because you want to make sure you can use the copy function. So you don't want to be copying across when your data is going down. <laughs> that gets really frustrating. Right, because this you copy, but the next the next something's down a row and then down a row, and it you, it's, you can't copy that way. So if you're going to copy across, you want to make sure the data is going across. So this project's not that way, but when I show you the franchise spreadsheet, you'll see you'll see what we have. There's the assumption. I'm going to have the base case, the best case, the worst case, and then I'm going to have the source. Your project will probably have something similar to this. I've had some, some will do the base, best, and worse this way. They'll do it down the side and just have one column. So either of those can work. The real key though, is if you have assumptions that are gonna, you have multiple assumptions, like we assume inflation is gonna be 5% the first two years, but then it's gonna be 2% thereafter or something like that. You gotta be real careful how you're gonna set that up. So we've spent a lot of time thinking on this, but either one of these approaches, I can't remember on the video what I did. I might've gone down the page. I'll go across on this one. Uh, either can work pretty well. And then the, the source. This source can be um, a person, could be a website link, 
let's say you're doing a, a hybrid car, your link could be Toyota's website giving the price and the expected mileage for that car. So someone can click on that and they say, oh, I can see the cost. Now you gotta be careful because that site could change <laughs> over time. So you might wanna have a link and then right here, you might actually have a picture of the actual site that you use. You might take snaps or whatever, just so you can show this is what the site looked like when we did our project. So that if you go to the Toyota site in six months and the car is now 50,000 instead of 45,000, they understand all the time I did that, it was a lower price, all right? But the website link can be good because that person might be curious, what is, what is the price today? I know when I bought my Prius 13 years ago, Toyota said, or 15 years ago, Toyota said it got 61 miles per gallon. Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it didn't. It got like 45, 50 miles per gallon. If I coasted down a, down a mountain, I would have gotten 61, but it wasn't getting 61. If I'd used 61 in my project, I would have said, wow, this is a really good car. It makes a lot of sense to get it. And then someone says, I'm not getting 61. You must've made a mistake. Well, I can show them the website. So you see Toyota said 61. So there, there you have it. Um, we have a website link. It can be another, as I said, another sheet in Excel that you reference. So you might, you might have CPI assumption and analysis. And then when you get the CPI, you reference that sheet with the, well, I'll show you how to hyperlink in the spreadsheet. So you see where we're going. When I load, when I grade your team's project, you can see what I'm looking for. Do I, can I tell exactly what you did, all right? And you gotta document this because your firm's making these big decisions. And when things go wrong, it's not that they wanna have someone to blame, but they don't understand, you know, what were you assume that didn't quite work out right? So that that time, the next time they do a project like this, they can not make that mistake again. <laughs> So maybe we don't trust auto manufacturers and what they say their miles per gallon are. Maybe that was in some odd ideal setting that you can never replicate that again. Maybe we should use 10% of that or 90% of that or something like that, all right? So let's look at this particular case. The first thing they give us is how many transactions we do a year. So transactions. In this case, we just have 80,000. We don't have a best or worst. You could put the 80 all the way across, or you can just put it in the base. If it's only in the base, then you say, hey, there's there's only one scenario here. I don't care on either one of these. I'm going to say this comes from cash management. I'm up for a person's name. But yeah, I just went, I went to Terry and said, well, how many of these do you do a year? Or I went to Carol, because Carol, that department worked, reported to Carol, even though they were in a different area. How many of these? Well, she knew how many they did a year because she had all kinds of uh, metrics that they used. So I said, okay, 80,000. How reliable is that? Well, it was it was 50,000 last year. And then at the end of the year, it had mushroomed because our customers are really loving this. So we saw a big increase. So the 80,000, what I did is December last year, I multiplied by 12 because December was so much higher than January or whatever. She has some explanation. You could put all of that in there. You could do it as a comment bar, anything that's going to help you understand where that 80,000 comes from. And then transactions per employee. So Carol tells me each employee can do 20,000 transactions. That's coming from cash payments as well. So it looks like she needs four people in that department. Now she doesn't use employee. What do you think she uses? I once had a student, I got them a job at USA as an intern and her boss came in to me all arrayed. She says, oh, she doesn't, she doesn't know anything. Says, what do you mean she doesn't know anything? Says, and there's this one thing she didn't know. This boss was real mad at her. And, I said, I don't think undergraduate students know what that term means, but y'all know what she used? Do y'all use that term? For, yeah, full-time equivalent. Y'all have heard that before. You better should know it because she was like irate. I can't believe she doesn't know what FTE is. 
It's like, I don't think they use that term a lot. Josh, would you hear that at work or in a class? Yeah, if you work for, the, I mean, FTE. Really important for Carol's department. It's going to be important for this project but because she can hire a 0.4 person. <laughs> That's going to be important. Do we have to use full people or do we can we have a, can we have a half a person? And she can have a half a person. She has a lot of part-time people in her department. It's real easy for her to have 2.3 people in her department, all right? That's not always true everywhere else. If you're in the accounting department, you might have part-time people that's more common, but you may not. So you may have a choice between two people or three people, but you can't do two and a half. So FTE allows you to have um, something other than a full person. So full-time equivalent. And she says each of them can do 20,000 transactions a year. So that's pretty good. Now the growth in transactions, that's someone's guess. Here, you can certainly look at the history and we, we knew the history on this because this is a fairly new thing when, when we took over this. So the growth was really fast. And so we had some talk on that. We I'm using 4% in this project. I can't remember the discussion we had on that. But remember here, this 4%, is only for check free. We knew the actual growth was going to be much higher for other other bill payers, but we're only working on check free here. Okay, so check free was already pretty well saturated with our customers. They've been using it for years, so four percent was there. We got that from cash management as well. Cash management, you might say, cash management based on recent history or something, it's always nice to have some basis for any of your assumptions. So here, any kind of growth rate is, that's that's pretty important, whether it's an inflation rate or growth. Like if you're going to do a franchise, your most important number is your revenue forecast. So how much revenue, I was listening to a podca uh, podcast that was really, really good. It was on uh, Orange Fitness, Orange theory. It was really, really interesting. Um, very, very successful franchise. Um, but the guy and in, in, uh, actually recommend this podcast, really, really excellent. He said they went out and surveyed 300 franchisees and got how long does it take before you have enough clients that you're covering all your costs? That's a pretty important piece of information that you want to put in there. And he said, out of all 300 of them, every one of them said it was six months or less. Well, that's good to know. 300 out of 300. Very successful franchise. The owners are very, very, very happy. Why? Because it's very predictable. This isn't McDonald's. McDonald's shows up. You don't have to do much. People just show up to your business. Orange Theory, they got to do some advertising, promote a little bit. In fact, when I was listening to podcasts, I go, I wonder if there's an Orange Theory near me. And yeah, there's one right around the corner. I had no idea. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I could jog to it and I could jog to it and jog home and I don't even know what to join, but it's just right around the corner. You know, it's pretty close. I had no idea. I didn't know what, I, I, I probably thought it was a, uh, like a jambalaya or something, you know, or it's like, oh, look, I can go get a smoothie. Um, so that's a very, very, on franchises, probably the most important number. The other numbers on a franchise, like your cost of goods sold, how many employees, those are pretty easy to forecast, but getting that revenue is really, really critical. Getting this transaction growth is pretty important for us to get right because we're not going to have 80,000 transactions in five years. We're going to have much more than that, which means we may have to have, have to hire, have hired another person. So we're not just going to save four people. We might ultimately save five or six people. So we need to know that growth rate. That's really, really important. Uh, some of the struggles teams have had in the past is if you're hiring minimum wage people, how much do you pay minimum wage? What's the problem with minimum wage workers right now? They're hard to find, aren't they? <laughs> they don't want to work because they can get better pay because they're high demand. They can quit and go somewhere else and get a bonus. You know, it's kind of a good time to be um, working for fast. I think I saw McDonald's is doing $14 an hour now. Um, so, you know, the pays are coming up. We're having a lot of people debating minimum wage, like a $15, $16 minimum wage. You know, those kind of things. Is that going to affect me on my, my pay? 
And if minimum wage goes to 16 bucks, then your higher paid workers are probably going to see their pay go up as well. Those are important assumptions. You don't, you don't just stick in 2% and say it's 2%. You got to really think about the actual costs that you have there. Um, the next thing they have, this is the most important, the percentage of transactions converted. So we went to check free and we said, okay, check free. We know we can't convert every single one of your bills to electronic, but we think we can convert a high percentage. So we said, and Check Free really wanted us to do this project. So we asked Check Free, how many do you think you can convert? And Check Free told us 90%. So I used their forecast as my best case. Why? Because they had an incentive to lie. Right. That's why if I'm doing miles per gallon, I might take what the auto manufacturer is saying as my best case because they have an incentive to lie to me. Right. If I'm doing a franchise, my best case might be what they tell me my revenue is going to be. Um, now, I, I remember doing um, oh, it was one of the smoothies, Smoothie King. They actually provided pretty interesting information where they gave you a range they said, we went out to all of our franchises and this is the range on revenues. I thought that, well, that's, that's kind of helpful. The, the bad part of it was that some of their franchises have drive-throughs and some don't, and they didn't separate those two. And so we didn't know, you know, if we're gonna do, if we're gonna do a franchise with a drive-through, I'd rather have just those numbers. But they at least gave you, you know, 90% were at least this, 50% were this. That, that's really helpful information to do. So if you're going to do a franchise, you probably want to find one that's providing that kind of information because that's going to help you with the scenarios. My base case was, uh, I think I used 70%. What I did there was Check Free gave me 10 of their customers. And I called those customers. They, they have already converted. And so I call those customers and I ask them, what percentage did you convert? And the 70% was the median of those 10. So 50% of them did better than 70%, 50% was lower. And in my worst case, I used 50%. And that was the worst case of those 10 customers. <laughs> I said, what if we're as bad as Check Free's worst experience? And so that's where I got those. One thing you want to do here, very, very important, is best. It's from check free base. It's from check free customers survey. And worst is lowest check free customer. You know, something like that. I don't, when you do it, um, when you do this for the Excel application, I don't care if you do all of that. But for your team case, this is very, very important. What is your rationale for your best base and worst? All right, try to find some basis for that. One thing that's really, really helpful on franchises, not I'm trying to push you to a franchise, but something that's really helpful on franchises is YouTube. Go on YouTube, enter your franchise. You know, you, you should go look at Subway. Just everything's negative. No one, no one likes Subway anymore. Uh, now, I discovered today, um, let me see if I can find this i think i took a picture of it i was on my bike so i had to be careful um so there's a website it's called the wolf report franchise analysis i don't know if it's free yet or not when I went onto it on my bike, it asked me if I wanted to subscribe, and I don't like want to subscribe while I'm pedaling. So I'm going to find out if this is something we can actually use in this class. He was very knowledgeable, very interesting. There's a few questions he was asked that he didn't answer correctly. So there's some jargon I would use that wasn't his jargon. In fact, one point the, the interviewer says that was all interesting that the last ten minutes what you said, but that wasn't what I was asking. <laughs> I was asking something else, but that was all really interesting. I'm not upset, but. So uh, one thing he asked for was the payback. And he didn't answer that question. And payback's really, really important on our franchise. How long is it going to be till you get all that initial investment back? Is it, you know, for a typical franchise, it can be eight to 12 years. What was it for this one? 
but he didn't answer that question. I don't know if it's out there on his, but that's a pretty, if you do YouTube, that's a pretty common one. You'll see there's a, there are a lot of YouTubers that do these franchise reports and they'll say, this is a really good franchise or paybacks only six years. It's really amazing. You'll get your money back fast. All right. So there's some good sources and that can be really, really helpful. YouTube or whatever for getting these ranges, but you have to have some rationale. You can't just pick a number randomly. If inflation's the key, then that's where the historical inflation numbers can be really helpful. You can say our best case is the 80th percentile and the worst case is the 20th percentile and our base case is the mean. You can do something like that. So at least you have some basis for running your scenarios. All right. How much now on employees, you're going to have to do this as well. Most of your cases are probably going to have an employee of some kind. Uh, I guess there's some cases that wouldn't be that, but um, you need to break it out between base, salary, and uh, other comp. All right. So their base pay is 50,000 and other comp is 15%. So base pay. 50,000 uh, benefits, 15%. Where did I get this? I got this from payroll. Got that from payroll. And it's usually pretty simple. You call payroll and you say, hey, I, I know at USA they had grades. So these are probably grade 18 jobs. I started off as a grade 24. I still remember that. I don't know what it is today at USA, but these are probably grade 18, 19 jobs. They weren't uh, college educated, but probably high school educated people. Um, and so I just go to the payroll. I need, what's the pay for grade 18 people? Oh, it's $50,000. And then add the benefits on top of that. The 401k, that's about 6%. The pension plan, that's about 5%. Um, they had a holiday bonus, you know, all these other things. So I would put all that in there. So I got the pay. The next thing you're going to notice on here is indirect employee costs. And that is $500 a year. Now, why am I putting that in there? So these are costs that if you let these four people go, the cost would just be allocated to someone else. So they're not they're not part of this project. But why do I put that? I'm gonna say did not use. Not relevant. Why would you think I would put that in my Excel? Someone loads your file is what if that's one of their questions? Did you include uh, indirect costs? How long would it take them to figure out if you did or not? Didn't. It's right there. So yeah, indirect costs about five hundred dollars for telephones and computers and all those kind of things. Yeah, USA charges like they were charging like forty dollars a month for a telephone. With a telephone, they cost forty dollars a month. They were allocating a lot of IT people time to a telephone, and so most almost all of those costs will not go away. Now you do have to be careful here. Um, I remember one project. We thought it was possible we would eliminate so much that it would free up space at USA and they wouldn't have to add more buildings. And so I went to a guy named Wayne. I don't know if y'all know, any of y'all know Wayne. At the time, he was head of uh, facilities at USA. Today, he's the CEO of USA. But at that time, he was head of facilities. I go, okay, Wayne, I got this project and I don't know when I need to come to you so that you can give me some savings because I've saved you so much space. You know, electricity is lower. And so he says, okay, I'll tell you what, Ron, if you don't, if you don't cut at least 50 people, don't even talk to me. There's no savings. So that's okay. 50 people. So at least enough. If I cut 60 people, then there may be something. That's pretty good information to know. So he'll help me out. So I just kept that. I don't know if that's still true today. And I'm sure if he asked him, he won't remember that, that conversation. <laughs> but I want to put indirect is very, very important because people usually ask that question. So you just want to know what was that? What did you do with that? Um, 
expected inflation. So where's the inflation gonna come in? Now you can have multiple inflation rates. So me, this is inflation for payroll. And that's about the only, only dollar amount I need to inflate. There's really none others. But you may have a different inflation rate for your revenues, a rate for your employees, a rate for your uh, the food that, you know, if you're doing a restaurant, um, for uh, Orange uh, Theory, such a strange name for a company, Orange Theory, you know, the part of the question is, do they have employees? Are these employees, or are they contract? So that can be part of, of the issue. Um, and then they have different employees. They have the person that you walk in and they're at the desk. You have the trainers. You would imagine the trainers are probably gonna be different. So you could even have different inflation rates for different workers. So you may have multiple of these and there may be like, you may have four inflation rates, but only one of them are you gonna run scenarios on. So there's, there's no limit to what you can do here. It all comes down to what do you know? Now, if you have five things that are gonna have inflation rates, but you don't really have an opinion on different inflation rates then don't have five inflation rates, all right? If you got electricity and water and advertising and you just think they're all going to grow 3%, then just have one inflation rate. But do think about it. Is there something unique in their cost structure that we think one of these items might grow faster than the other, right? So you want to keep that in mind. So here, inflation rate we're using is 5%. Where do we get that? Well. Oh, come on, Bill Gates. Yeah, he's not gonna let me, he's not gonna let me do it. That comes from CFO. In our budgeting process at USAA, there were official assumptions to use for all kinds of things. Payroll, payroll increases, that was an official CFO number, so I just used that number. I'm not gonna challenge that. Someone's already done the work and they say that's what to use, so that's what we use. And then the IT development cost. Now this one I don't really like. It's $565,000. What I don't like about this is I know there are some allocated indirect costs in that number, but it would take me years to figure it out. So sometimes you just throw in the towel and say, you know what, it's 565. I know it's not really that number. I know there's some costs they're allocating from the CEO of, of IT or whatever, but you know what, it's the number, it's the number I have. So it, that comes from a information tech department, maybe you have a name of someone, but you go to them and say, how much is it gonna cost you to, to do the software for us? And they'll give you an estimate based on what you tell them. And they said 565. Now, the nice thing about this, this, is, this particular cost is it's, it's at time zero, which means since it's at time zero, its present value is 565. So if the net present value of my project comes in at negative $10,000, then I know if the IT costs go down by $10,000, then this project makes sense because it's all time zero. And that's real important. I don't want any teams to do scenarios on time zero costs. I don't want you to say, well, it could be 750, it could be 850 or whatever, or 650. I don't want you to do it. If it's time zero, you'll know exactly how much more or less you can spend at time zero because that's your net present value. That's just at time zero. So it makes it really, really simple. So don't do scenarios like you're, you're gonna buy a house and you're not sure the house can be 500,000 or 600,000. We use 500,000. And then if your project comes out with a positive value of 120,000, you know, you could pay as much as 620 and you still have a good project, all right? But let's say you do your project at 500 and it's positive and then you go to buy the house and the house is now $850,000. Well, you're probably gonna stop and redo the whole project anyway at that point. That's the nice thing about a time zero cost is if it radically changes, you can just shut down the project. It's hard to a cost you have five years out, that one you're kind of stuck with, right? If you start the project, but time zero costs, don't run scenarios on that one. And then the last one is the cost of capital. I don't care what you use on that. 
I'm recommending you just use 5%. In reality, you would do a lot of analysis of this, but we're not gonna talk about cost of capital until well after you've gotten into your case. So I don't want y'all to do that. So that's gonna come from CFO as well. USA has an official cost of capital that it uses for all projects. Very easy. I would just call up Laura and say, Laura, what's our cost of capital? And I would get that number. Very, very simple. So you can just use 5% if you like. So there's your assumptions. Oh, I said 7%. Sorry. I don't know why I said 5 So 7%. USA's cost of capital is not 7%. It's much lower than that. But that's what I'm using in this case. So there's all the assumptions. So your project that you're going to do with your team, this is actually the single most important thing you're going to do. So as soon as you get case one behind you, you want to start building this and you want to split it up with your team members. Each team member is probably going to go out and research one particular thing. So you want to have a, a project plan. Projects that have a lot of assumptions, give, you, give your team members something to work on. They're better projects. Just makes it a lot easier. Um, a lot of times with franchises, you may have one team member that uses the official document from the franchise. You may have some other teams that go out and research YouTube videos and other things, you know, try to see what are other people saying about this franchise. One thing I think is really, really cool about some of these projects is to go find someone who's actually doing this and use that the, uh, you know, I'm a poor stressed out college student won't you please help me? And you'll just find someone that'll say, yeah, yeah, I can help you out um, and see if they'll interview. I've tried that with Subway and had, had, have had really horrible luck with sub, Subway franchisees. They just don't want to talk to anybody. I think they're all mad that they did a Subway and they're just like, it's just humiliating to them for some reason. Um, but you might be able to find someone that's willing to talk to you. Uh, one of the problems with Subway is most Subway owners own five, 10 of them. You know, they don't just own one. And so you'll maybe never catch them. Um, sometimes you can talk to the workers. You know, if you go during a slow time and say, hey, I'll buy, I'll buy you lunch for your break or something. If you'll, you know, tell me what you know about this franchise. Um, sometimes just visiting. So you might have a team member, just go visit and see, see, what, see what they're doing. Uh, I had one team. Um, it was, this was the, uh, pharmaceutical one. Pretty cool. Um, they were really curious how many people would use a kiosk at an HEB pharmaceutical and they want to do a survey. Well, they just create, they, they knew several hundred people on Facebook. So they just went to Facebook and they put a survey out there. I got this project. Your friends on Facebook would all respond, wouldn't they? It's pretty cool. So you put a survey out there. Is it perfect? Statistically, it's probably got some some mess with it because your friends are probably all young and you know different. Probably don't buy pharmaceuticals, so you got to beg them to ask their parents and grandparents. But but that's not bad. At least you have some data, some basis for your assumption. How many people would use this? I think another team that did the kiosk and the uh, food court here. I think they did the same thing—a survey among their friends. So you know, so your projects lend itself to work and break it up between different people. Um, Oh, yeah. I remember one team, they were doing a Tesla recharging station. And this guy, well, this team was wonderful. He's a graduate student. But um, I was like, man, you put a lot of time in this project. He went to a charging station, parked, and just watched. <laughs> and how often was there a car in there? So he probably sat there a couple of hours and just took notes. It's like, that's, that's commitment. I'm not asking you all to do that, but that's what he did. Maybe you could put a hidden camera there and just video all day and just see how many customers. But that's powerful information that makes your case much stronger because you you kind of independently correct corroborate the data that you're getting. So you're trying to build this, get it so that you're comfortable with it, um, and you want a good case, business case, so your team knows what to do, when it's due, those kind of things. Um, I'm a um, I'm a pert chart person. Do any of y'all use pert charts? Critical path. They're wonderful things. I'd never heard of it, but the C CMA exam, some of y'all might do the CMA chartered financial management accountant. They had perk charts and critical paths on it. I'd never heard of it. So uh, some of your IT people, have y'all had this yet? Who's our information tech people? 
Linda, have you heard perk charts in Critical Path? Yeah, IT people use them all the time. You might Google it and see. So what a perk, I don't know what the difference of them are. To me, they're the same. But what a Critical Path is, is it shows all the activities that you need and how long they're going to take. And the Critical Path is the one that if you're, if you're late on this one, the whole project's late. So you may have one path that goes along, but if you're late on this one, it doesn't matter because it finishes before everything else anyway. So the critical path is that path that, hey, if we're late on this one, the whole project gets derailed. So you might say, okay, I need this person, I need your data by this date because if I don't get it back this date, I can't, I can't build the Excel spreadsheet. And so each person knows where they fit in. So on this particular project that I'm showing right here, I use the critical path. I was like, okay, Carol, I need that number from your report by this date. And see, I'll have it to you, I'll have it to you, because if you don't get it to me, the project's going to be delayed and we'll be in trouble. It, was, it wasn't on this project, but it was a, it was a Carol Walls project. So you want to you get organized, especially after project one's done, because that's the big part of the, the remainder part of the semester. All right, I don't need the CPI assumptions, but now we're going to do the base case. You're going to have a best case, a worst case, and a break even. This isn't the only way to do it. You could also do stochastic analysis, which is really, really cool. We're doing simulations. You could have 20 cases, not just three cases. So there's different ways. I'm going to show you some ways you can do stochastic or simulation kind of things there. But the key here, which is really, really important, is to get your assumptions and then build the base case and don't go any further. That's what I'm meeting with you is on your base case. Because if the base case is a problem, then the best and worst case are going to be messed up too. And I'm going to show you, once you get the base case built, the best and worst case take a few seconds. <laughs> They're fast. So you want to get the base case absolutely perfect. And then once you get that, then your team's ready to do the final things for your presentation. All right. So in the base case, you're going to have time. You're probably going to have a section on benefits. You're probably going to have a section on cost. You have to decide how many columns you have. I think more columns is better. So if you need more detail, add more detail, more columns. Um, Make it look professional, you know, use some color co coding. And then on time, so I'm, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you some net present value right here, how I do it, and this is my recommendation. So on time, what I like to do is I like to start with today's date. So you just type today, open, close parentheses, and that's gonna bring in today's date, all right? So equal today, open, close. I don't know what you would put inside the parentheses if you, if you wanted to put something there. So what's going to happen if I open this file tomorrow? It's going to change the date. All right. Now we're going to do what's called the mid-year convention. And I want you all to use the mid-year convention. And you'll see it on the Excel applications. What the mid-year convention says is, so one of my benefits on this project is I'm going to save, save salaries. And I won't save them time zero, but I'm going to save them during year one. But if I put year one, it's February 23rd, 2024, that's going to assume I pay my employees all in one year. But I'm not. I'm going to pay them throughout the year. All right. So if I use 223.24, it's going to assume I pay them one time exactly one year from now. Well, I could put in every pay. They get paid every two weeks, so I could do every two weeks, but that's going to be a lot of dates, especially if I go out 10 years. That's going to be, you know, 500 dates. Well, let's just simplify this. I'm going to pay them every two weeks, but let me just assume I pay them exactly in six months, their entire year in six months. That's going to be kind of close to me paying them throughout the year, wouldn't it? That's called a mid-year convention. You're going to do, if you do a franchise, you're going to do this. You're going to assume your, your revenues, you're not going to, if you, you're not going to get them all at the end of the year. You can get them throughout the year, but let's just assume all your revenues come in six months. 
And that's that mid-year convention, all right? So instead of using 365, what am I gonna use? 365 divided by two. So I'm gonna assume I'm gonna pay them August 24th. Or if you wanna be real accurate, you do 365.25 because of leap year, and then you have it, all right? And then the next year, you're gonna add 365. Again, so that we have the mid-year of that second year. You'll see that, so really, really important. The first year, you add 365 divided by two. The next year, you add, you add 365 because you want it exactly a year from that. So this is time 0.5, this is time 1.5. Now we realize it's really, this is really time zero to one, we're just going to average it and use 0.5. We really know this is from time one to time two. We're just going to average it and make it time 1.5. Everybody understand that? Which, which one? This one here. And when I do the videos, I usually uh, copy and paste the formulas as text off to the right so that you can see them. I'm not going to do that here. So I divide by two the first time because I want to be six months out. And then after that, I just add 365. Right? Now, would you change something else? So let's say you're going to do going to do a real estate project. So let's say you go out one, two, three, four, five years. But you're going to do a real estate project and you're going to sell that house in exactly five years. Then what do you want it to be? Then you want it to be that plus 365.25 times five. Then you want that to be exactly your five. All right, so your benefits during your five, you're gonna use a major convention, but if you're gonna sell that house exactly in five years, then you want it to be exactly five years, All right? What I did at USA, because I knew they pay taxes every quarter, I actually put the taxes in there exactly in the days they pay taxes. So y'all don't have to worry about taxes, but all right. So I have to decide how many years we go out here, but there's my years, there's my benefits. There's my cost. If you want to, you know, color code it, green for benefits, some orange for cost or whatever. I don't know if I need that many columns, or I'm going to put that many columns in there. What you're going to discover, you're going to do everything on a nominal basis in here, which means it's going to be actual cost. So inflation, you're going to have inflation. Inflation is very, very important. We're going to have inflation. Um, so it's going to be the actual cost in those future years. And then over here, we're going to do the calculations where we're doing the net present value. What that means is you're going to have your net cash flow here. This is going to be the, that all important column. Because all the calculations for payback and net present value and turnover rate return are going to be the right to this. And this part of your spreadsheet is going to be exactly the same no matter what you do. This is the part up to here, which will change. But what you're after is that, that net cash flow for your project. Once you have that, the whole rest of the spreadsheet is exactly the same. Okay. Do you make it look professional? You might actually use this spreadsheet in an interview. You want it to make it look really, really nice. If you did 3% of the work, I wouldn't do it. But if, you know, if you're the Excel person for your team, then yeah, you could say, hey, here's a spreadsheet I built. This, this would be a very impressive type of spreadsheet. All right, so what are my benefits? So on this project, I need to build up to the benefits. So I have transactions. I have transactions converted. Then we have FTEs saved. 
I have my pay and benefits. I can combine them because my pay is 50,000. My benefits is, is uh, 15%. So I don't, that's always 15%. I don't need to break those up. So that's, that's, this is going to be my, my savings. It's going to be going to save these salaries. All right. So that's, that's all I need there. I, I, what, I'm, I am going to add one more thing. I forgot to put one more thing. I'm going to put pay and then pay and benefits. You'll, you'll see why I'm going to do that. This is actually a struggle some, some have. There's sometimes where you have to put things separate, and you'll, you'll see it real quickly here. All right, so time zero, we don't have any transactions. At time zero, we're just building the software, so nothing's there. So you're going to have one row where the only thing in that row is your upfront cost. And then year one, we're going to have 80,000 transactions. Then in the second year, how many transactions will we have? We'll have 80,000 times what? One plus my growth rate. I'm going to hit F4 to lock that in. There's my next year, All right? So you'll be doing this, some kind of growth rate. You might have an inflation rate, you might have a growth rate, but there's my growth rate. I'll copy that in. So how many years out do I go? Well, if you look at the problem, they tell you. Forecasted benefits and costs should not go beyond five years into the future. Each one of your cases, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend, but they say five years. So we'll go five years. There's our five years. One, two, three, four, five. So we got our forecast. Now, how many should you do? Well, if you're doing a franchise, you're probably going to have to go 15, 20 years. Most franchises don't break, at, break even until about 10 years. So you're, you're not going to open a subway and get all your money back in two or three years. It's just not going to happen. Now, if you're doing a, a real estate project, let's say you want to say, hey, I want to buy a house to save rent on an apartment. It's going to take you 25, 30 years to get your money back. Now, how can you shorten that? Well, you could say, well, I'll buy the house today, save the rent, and then I'll sell the house in 10 years. Well, then you, you got 10 years. You just stop. What, about, what if you're doing a hybrid car? Well, how long is the car going to last? Are you going to do 30 years on a hybrid car? Probably not going to last that long. If you're doing solar panels, it usually takes 20, 25 years for solar, pan solar panels to pay back. So you're probably going to have to go out that far. It's, it's going to be, be difficult. Um, all right, so it depends. Each one of your projects is one of the things you're going to have to sit around sit up and talk about is how many years they go out. The nice thing, though, is if you get it set up correctly, you can probably easily go 500 years just by copying it down, you know, so if you get it set up correctly, that last year should be very easy to copy down as many years as you want to go, which may be important because let's say you do solar panels and you only go 20 years and it's still negative. Your boss might say, well, how long will it take? And so then you just keep copying and say it takes 38 years. And your boss says, forget it, 38 years, I'll be dead by then. I'm not going to do this project. Um, but at least you know, you know what the answer is. You, you may not make that. You know, you could go out 50 years and say the net present value is 10,000, but 50 years is ridiculous, especially if it's a car. But that'd be good information to your boss to say, well, for this hybrid to make sense, the car is going to last 23 years. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. You give him information on top of his head, you can say, yeah, let's forget it. That's, that's not going to that's not going to work. So now how many are we going to convert? Well, that's our assumption for the base case is 70 percent. So we can copy that down. Now, this last year, you notice it's a very unround number. So should you round, I strongly recommend that you do not round anywhere. Okay. Being the, the fact that we have point, point zero seven nine three, it's, it's not material to this project, right? It doesn't hurt us to have a fraction. Uh-huh, Joshua. So you start out. Well, these are annual. I'm just assuming it's eighty thousand. 
but when we get the dollars for pay, we're going to assume the entire pay is paid in six months. So you're, you're, it's correct. There's kind of a mix. This is, if you want to, Joshua, y'all can certainly do this. You can say uh, time and n if you want to. Time would be time zero, time one, time two, or year. Maybe you could say year if you want to. Ah, my word. So following years, if it's mid year, mid year convention every six months, then when that 8.5, 1, 1.5? Yeah. So you're in, this is your year. Year one, year two, year three, years four, year five. But your discount rate is going to be 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to transactions because we don't have to discount them. It only applies to dollars. So we need an N because we're going to use XMPV and XMPV needs an actual date. So if we, if we, we don't want to use ends because if we use N of one, it's going to assume all that happens exactly in one year. All right. So it, it does get confusing. What year are we in and what discount, what N are we using for the discount? So here we can use, you know, 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, all the way down. So if that's, you know, if that's, you know, if you're kind of confused about what year are we in, you can certainly add a column if you want to over on the side. It's not required, but you certainly can. But this is really the end. We're talking about a discounted cash flow, cash flow divided by one plus I to the end. This is the end, except the thing here though is with XMPV, the end, you actually put the actual date in there. You don't put the actual end in there. And then Excel does the end for you by taking that date minus today's date and you know, divided by 365, Excel does all that work for you. All right, so how many FTEs did we say? Well, we converted 56,000. How many can each FTE do? They can each do 20,000. And I'm assuming they're not, they're not going to get any better at it. There's no reason they would get better at it because it's such a manual process. So I'm assuming there's my FTEs. I'm not going to round that either. I'm going to leave that just like it is. Now, you could, if you wanted to round it, you could use the function trunk. And the trunk function will, will actually not even round it. It just says, hey, if it's 2.9, make it 2. You could do that. but. You'll see when we get the break even that you don't want to do rounding because it really messes up the break even. So just leave it unrounded. And then what is the pay? Well, in the first year, it's fifty thousand, but that's going to grow at five percent. So there's my pay. And so how much do I save? I save 2.8 FTEs and they each make $50,000 times one plus the 15%. I'll see why I did that. I added that 15, I just added 15% on top of that. And that's how much I'm gonna save. So I've got, that's exactly how much this project is going to save you. All right. So we'll, we'll finish up the rest. We're almost done because we have very few costs in this project. 